Thank you, everybody, for having me here. It is, I'm super stoked to be here. Um, I wanted to entitle this Thriving in the Gray just because I just got back from South by Southwest and I gave a, a talk over there. And during the Q&A, this guy from Oklahoma came out and he basically was like, well, you know, I really want to do a cannabis event in Oklahoma, but the laws are so gray, so I don't know if I should do it. And I tried to encourage him. I'm like, that's amazing. It's gray. You could totally do it. Um, so I just wanted to kind of touch on that point and kind of walk you through my cannabis journey, the businesses that we started, and how we were like essentially capitalized on um, these gray markets. So I started my career in 2004. I uh, was on the development team for the Oakland Fox Theater, and the Oakland Fox Theater was the cornerstone development um, of the revitalization product project of downtown Oakland. And um, this project, real quick, was a, scheduled to be a $25 million project, ended up going over $80 million, and it required a ton of fundraising. So my job was to go out in the community and try to solicit fundraising from the local uh, neighbors. And we, I was surrounded by all of the pot clubs and all of the cannabis businesses. And together, the cannabis businesses ended up becoming the second largest private donor behind Bank of America on this project. So we could not have gotten it done without them. Um, I, and once that project was built, I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm really tired. I really want to do something fun and somewhat easy. I know I'll go like join those guys, right? So um, I ended up working at Oaksterdam University uh, for the founder, and um, I was working on the Proposition 19 campaign, which unfortunately lost by a pretty slim margin. And, um, and during that campaign, Richard Lee was always proponent of um, having more soldiers in the war on drugs, right? So he always advocated for all of us to start our own businesses and really um, tried to push us to have and go after different types of licenses. So with his blessing, I applied for my own dispensary application. I got ranked number one in that process, and um, that was on... March 14th, 2012, and then on April 2nd, 2012, two weeks later, we got raided. And so, as you can imagine, this day totally sucked, and I hid under my covers for a pretty long time. Um, so, at that point, the city of Oakland had already, like, slotted um, the budgets, the projected revenue that they'd be getting from these dispensaries into their budgets. So when I was like, hey, I just went through this pretty traumatic event. I'm really uncertain if I want to um, open up a dispensary. They were like, well, sorry, you kind of got to use it or lose it, and we'll give it to the next person. So um, I, my partner and I really did some soul searching and just kind of decided to march forward and, and we just kind of had to do it because we've invested so much in this already. We had been trying to like pioneer this route together and it was kind of the next thing. And at that point it was medical only and we really were serving patients and so we felt like that was, the, that was our way of contributing. So um, that permit at, those t at that time basically encompassed everything cannabis. So if you got one of those dispensary licenses, you could do anything in cannabis. So we quickly decided, we're like, all right, great. We got the retail, it's set up. Then we quickly expanded to cultivation. And then from there, we're like, okay, extraction and vape pens started coming out and we decided to invest in extraction technology. And then from there, we decided to invest in a brand. So then that way we can like actually have our, our extracts and our cannabis sold in other outlets other than just our own retail. Um, so as we were going through that process and like have we had Bloom open, one of our largest expenses just being in downtown Oakland, kind of in the hood, and um, was security. So w there was an opportunity for us to start our own security company with a former lieutenant, Michael Yule. And so we decided to just invest in it and decided to start a security company. So we started Core Security Solutions. Core Security basically provides security guards for cannabis and cannabis businesses, as well as transport services um, and, um, and distribution services. And it was really interesting because at that time in 2012, like the idea of hiring a retired police officer was amazing. It was like, 
the coolest thing. So, um, so it was, it was also, it was really neat. And then uh, that kind of gave us the perspective of like having a business that we can essentially work with our, our competing dispensaries and our competing cultivations and our competing grows. So it definitely sparked our appetite for having those ty other types of businesses. Um, so um, as we were going through cultivation and going through the different cultivation projects, um, construction and construction services ended up becoming a very regular thing, specifically in Oakland. So we actually had an opportunity to start a construction company. So we started SK Builders, which essentially um, basically helped specialize in cultivation, cultivation processes, efficiencies, and their end and basically navigating the very complicated Oakland building department. So, um, yeah. Um, so, um, in 2015, it was, it was essentially the beginning of what was MKSI. We started pooling our funds together and started uh, investing in businesses that we're, we were friends with because we were operators, we understood how folks operated, but we also were able to um, kind of understand how to go through uh, the process of soliciting capital for the, all different various types of businesses. So um, one of the couple investments that we're super proud of is Canacraft and Cookies. Um, Bloom was, the, so at, in 2016, we were able to take our dispensary, our cultivation, and our brand, and our manufacturing, bundle them up, and basically navigated the process to take it public. And we essentially became the first plant-touching company to uplist on the American Stock Exchange, which was super difficult back then because you couldn't verify the funds, right? You can't tell the SEC, like, hey, I took in, like, $4 million of cash, I swear, you know? Like, we had to, like, navigate how to have third-party audits and auditors to verify the cash in order to uplist to the OTCQX. So um, the Bloom exit is essentially what really launched and propelled MKSI investments. Um, so after we exited Bloom and its, its holdings, um, one of the other dispensaries that we, or I'm sorry, one of the other businesses that we started was Grasshopper Kiosks. So Grasshopper is a compliant kiosk system. It is a retail footprint of approximately seven square feet. And it was a solution for us because our dispensaries were typically really small. And we wanted to, um, at the height of Bloom, we were seeing about 1,200 to 1,400 people a day. And so having different stations was important to us. So we basically invested in this technology. And then as Proposition uh, 64 passed, we figured out how to make them compliant and tap into metric and then tap into different POS systems. This was also an investment that we were pretty proud of and, and fond of just because, you know, with retail and dispensaries, it's, it's, I mean, I can't imagine cannabis always only being sold in dispensaries and delivery services. I, I feel like at some point it has to be sold at CVS. And so, but you'll always need it to be secured and you always want it to upload to the state's metric program. So we just wanted to like solve for that now. So where do I spend my time? I spend my time on one of our subsidiaries called Highland Events. And Highland Events is um, our little baby. It's my favorite. Um, we basically specialize in curating the best cannabis experiences at mainstream music festivals and venues. What does that mean? We basically try to sell weed at concerts. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So effectively, after starting all these businesses, I realized we're just really good at selling weed. And so like, and because we're not in the dispensary retail business anymore, it's effectively a pop-up dispensary. So what we did was, oh yeah, so before I get into that, we have a four-prong business plan. So first it's concessions. It's essentially just like taking in the product and selling it, right? in a compliant manner, which is, I assure you, has its own set of challenges. Um, compliance, because most people um, just can't really navigate the com complex hurdles between local and state and 
all of the different distribution to retailer and all the different permits and requirements that are associated with it. And we figured out a way to like streamline it and scale it. Um, sponsorship, basically uh, having been in this industry for a really long time, having really good relationships with the it brands who have the capacity and the budgets to be able to sponsor large scale events and then licensing. Um, licensing really is more so for white labeling. So for instance, this is my dream. I'm putting it out there in the universe. Rihanna wants a vape pen. We'll be able to be like, sure, I mean, we can make Rihanna her own vape pen, something like that. Um, so the, uh, our case study was Grasslands. Um, I don't know how many went to Grasslands last year at Outside Lands. Um, that was an experience that we had that unfortunately was sponsorship only just because AB 2020, which is the bill that allows for you to sell cannabis at concerts and venues, hadn't passed quite yet. So we decided to take this as an um, education event. And so what we did with Superfly and Another Planet Entertainment was create experiences where people are really immersed in the brands. And one of the activations that I'm the most proud of is this thing the smell wall. So basically you walked up to it, explained to you what a terpene was, what cannabis derived terpenes were. So give you a blurb on different, different types of terpenes. You'd walk up to the apparatus, you'd put your face in it, you'd spray it and you'd get that aroma. And, um, and along with reading this blurb about it, and then you're able to walk, um, like, I don't know, 10 feet to your right to the lemonade stand and then have a fresh squeezed lemonade with cannabis derived terpenes infused into it. And then also too, Flocana had a really cool activation where like they had a bong carving contest and then it was judged by some of the folks at the gastro magic <laughs> stage. So that was pretty cool. And this is just a couple more, more pictures of it. Um, again, this year at Grasslands, at Outside Lands, we're hoping to have concessions, assuming that the city of San Francisco's process moves along and um, we're like super stoked to be just trying to figure out how to make sure that like people have a safer, safer alternative to alcohol when they, they're at these events. Um, so yeah, some of the challenges is obviously scaling. It's, there's a ton of hurdles. Um, we're trying to figure them out. Um, and then discrepancy between state and federal laws. The way that we sort of were able to get AB 2020 passed was giving control to the local governments, which unfortunately is like complete, it's super complex, um, just because the laws in Oakland are totally different than the ones in San Francisco, so you can't have a cookie cutter business approach. And that's pretty much it. Thank you.